Hello, my name is Chris Roberts, your host. Welcome to The Long Road. And <clears throat> here we are, um, we're taping this show Monday, the weekend, um, the first Monday after the long um, session, school board, keen school board session. It took about four or five hours and um, basically after about five hours, the only thing different going in and coming out was um, we added an extra $50,000 back on to the school budget. There was a lot of <clears throat> concern because the um, school board had told the administration to subtract $550,000 out of the school budget. And um, people were saying that they didn't have enough time to, to plan. Um, it was really short, it was unfair. People were concerned about the, the types of cuts, where the cuts were coming from. They were concerned where, um, why no cuts were taken from athletics, why no cuts were basically um, structural cuts. Um, the 3.7 teachers that um, positions that are going to be um, eliminated or, or not funded were 3.7 teachers that were retiring. So actually there was no one losing their job. Another question is that we have a principal um, retiring. The question is, what are we going to do with that um, fourth principal, that fifth principal, when we're looking at the possibility going down from five to four schools? Um, what do you do? Do you get a temporary person to come in, knowing that um, a year or two from now there would not be a position? Um, do you bring in someone on a per diem basis? or what and so those are a whole bunch of stuff um, we had when the school board a year ago tried to bring it down from five to four there was an uproar and people were saying no it can't be done can't be done it's going to be detrimental of the students even thought it's been done around the country and in quite a few places and um, but it was kind of strange going forward into this year this summer when we were looking at the possibility of not bringing back those 41 teachers, that some of the parents that totally objected to um, going from five to four were more than willing to go from five to four in order to save a, a teacher at their school. The other part in the school board discussion was a long, long di discussion was concerning um, the one article that was submitted by petition concerning um, asking for the people to vote on going down from five to four. Um, some of the people we're talking about is yes, they agreed wholeheartedly that um, this, we needed to go from five to four, but as long as it wasn't Jonathan Daniels. So that would have opened the door is yes, we have to go, we agree with going down five to four as long as it wasn't my school. But that the way, that's the way it works all the time. And so that wasn't changed. Jonathan Daniels is still on the, um, the warrant. And so again, that's just advisory. Um, <clears throat> so that'll be going on. But the biggest concern that I and some of the other people have is we spent a long time looking how to do this and what would be the best way to do it, what would be the best options. And again, it looks like there's a possibility we'll go back to um, the square one and look at it all over again, or as we like to say in the military or in corporate America, paralysis by analysis. And so if we keep delaying it, we keep overlooking it, we keep researching it, then we never have to make a decision. But the only problem about never making a decision, it's going to cost us more and more and more money, and we're not going to get our money's worth because sooner or later we're going to have to pay and we may end up paying for things that people tell us to pay for, not what we actually wanted. But one of the big things that, um, that was hit over and over and over again was um, the gifted and talented program. And um, gifted and talented, that has all different kind of connotations. And um, of course, most parents like to feel that their kids are, um, the gifted and talented one, and it's important that they get the gifted and, and talented um, programs. But the question is, just what is gifted and talented? Well, that, that comes down to the big one. 
you may have a son or a daughter that may be gifted or talented in math or in science, but may just be an average person in English or history. Very rarely do you get someone like um, Leonardo da Vinci or Newton or Copernicus or Galileo those, or Einstein, quote unquote, those people that are gifted and talented across the board, the true gifted and talented. But nowadays, very few people <clears throat> want to um, talk about that. And, um, and so, but then again, when you go and look at gifted and talented, people really, when you go and look at, get, that is truly the top one in 2% of a group. Not the top 10, not the top 20%, not the top 30%, the truly top 1 in, in 2%. And so, you know, if we had 4,000 um, students in the Keene School District, if you go by the strict gifted and talented, you may have 10 to 12 individuals that would fall into, if everything went right, that truly into the gifted and talented um, grouping. And so again, the question comes into who are those gifted and talented? Which standard would you use to judge those gifted and talented? Um, is it the teacher that makes a decision? Well, there's a lot of teachers who thought Einstein went, wasn't very smart. There's quite a few of our gifted and talented individuals who were bored and troublemakers who ended up being misjudged by um, classroom teachers and so we don't want to test because we say some people <clears throat> don't test very well so that would be um, an objective analysis but we want to have a subject analysis so it would go back and forth go back and forth so that's again like Saturday we spent quite a bit of time arguing over if we were going to have money to put into a gifted and talented program so basically, it's about $85,000. There's no doubt in my mind in a $61.5 million budget, you can find $85,000. Um, it's there, and it was a lot of time wasted over um, something that we could easily stood up and said, yes, we will find the money to make it happen. The other part, we spent 50, a bunch of time and it just, the, the extra $50,000 was voted by 51 to 47, which again was 0. .0008 of the budget for 50,000 bucks. Again, all little minor stuff, stuff that can be easily found in the budget. And so what I want to talk about is there was an <clears throat> individual who, who stood up and he said, he asked us, why are we talking about <clears throat> the gifted and talented program? Why are we talking about $2,000 here, $3,000 there, when overall, the around, around the world, when it comes to our students, our students may have the greatest self-esteem in the world, but they're getting their butts kicked in math and science, and they're just not competitive around the world. Are we missing the boat? Are we worrying about competing against ourselves where the rest of the world is competing at a, at a much higher level? And um, I think the individual who brought that up, it was right on the, um, the button. We want to feel good about ourselves. And because we want to feel good about ourselves, we want to set our own standards. And the reason it's much easier to set our own standards by lower rank standards, so it means that we can um, feel good about ourselves. And <clears throat> we've got here in Atlantic Magazine, the world schoolmaster. And it's about an individual, Andreas Schlesinger. He was, um, <clears throat> he didn't do, he was a mediocre, mediocre student in Hamburg, Germany. Didn't participate in any, or care about any of the classes, distress of his father, who was a professor of education. Later, as an alternative high school, at an alternative high school, teachers encouraged Schlesinger's fascination with science and math, and his grades improved. He finished at the top of his class, even winning a National Science Prize at the University of Hamburg. 
So again, here's an individual. You look at it. This individual probably would have made gifted and talented if we had an objective test. He was born. He dropped out of high school, went to an alternative high school. He got teachers that got into his brain, found out what made him tick and work. And he became an out, not only become outstanding student and finished top of his class, but science award. <clears throat> and he said, as part of it, going, he says, you know what? There has to be something about education. There has to be a way to evaluate ed the effectiveness of education. At the time, in 1986, the education established was dominated by tradition, theories, and ideolog ideology. You had people dealing with every subject except looking at reality. And so what he says, nope, there has to be a better way. There has to be a better way. So in April of 1996, he joined the OECP and his colleagues pitched the idea of designing a smarter, more amphibi amphibi ambibious test that had ever preceded it, a way to shift the OECD from measuring inputs like spending on schools to outputs, how much kids learn. Let me go back to here, how we get this. Um, oh, I'll get this word again. <clears throat> Okay, so ultimately in the spring of 2000, <clears throat> all the economic, um, these are the top 30 economic development um, countries in the world. <clears throat> in and so in 2000, there was 15 years, 15, in the year 2000, 15 year old students from 32 countries around the world took the program for international student assessment called PISA. You, if you want to know more about it, you can go right online and go, just type in Google PISA and they'll give you all the results, all the research and explain um, what's the point of it. The, te the exam tested more same age students in more developed countries than any other. And it measured not only students' retention of facts, but their readiness for knowledge workers' jobs for, and their ability to think critically and solve real life problems. One of the, um, the questions that, um, the complaints that a lot of teachers and educators and even parents have with no child left behind, they keep saying is, you know, with no child left behind, we have to teach to the test. We have to teach to the test. But the question would be asked, if you're teaching to the test, shouldn't you be getting really high scores on the test because you're teaching a very narrow focus? Well, this exam was, no, it's just not about memorizing retention of facts, which teaching a test would be, but their readiness for knowledge worker jobs and their ability to think critically and solve real world problems. The results were so stunning that the international newspapers leaked the rankings. The United States ranked somewhere above Greece and below Canada, a midland performance we've repeated every round since. To the astonishment of the Germans, who had believed that their system among the best in the world Germans ranked even lower. What did the United States do? <clears throat> the United States officials defended their schools, blaming poor performance on the relatively prevalence of immigrant families in the United States. But Schlesinger and his colleagues noted that native-born Americans performed just as unimpressively in fact. Worldwide, the share of children from immigrant backgrounds explained only 3% of the variance between countries. A country's wealth does not predict success, neither gross domestic product per capita predi predicted only 6% of the difference in scores. Schlesinger also noted, however, that in the United States in particular, poverty was destiny. Low income American children did and still do much worse than high income ones on PISA. More, but more poor kids in Finland and Canada do far better relative to their more privileged peers despite their disadvantages. And <clears throat> again, so here it is, we're getting poor grades in the United States, and we're saying the reason we're getting poor grades is because all the immigrant kids. And as I had talked about last week in the, um, the, Man in the union leader, when he was talking about the Manchester's test scores, well, the city average, for example, in grade three mathematics was 59. The state average was 80. So, you know, even if you give three points for um, immigrants 
And even if you give six points extra if it was if they were wealthy, basically that's 62, 68. That would still mean that Manchester was 12, third grade kids in Manchester were still 12 points below the state average. So according to this research, with what you would do for that 12 points, you take away the immigrants, you take away the economic status, and basically then you would have to ask is, what is causing the shortfall of those um, 12 points? Then when you went to, um, <clears throat> you compared the United States to Canada and Finland, is why is the, the gap between the poor kids in the United States and the, and the rich kids in the United States not changing whatsoever, but a poor kid in Finland and a poor kid in Canada is not restricted to where he or she is unfortunately born. If you happen to have, um, if you have poor parents in Finland or you have poor parents in Canada, they're doing something in the Canadian system and the Finnish system that allows people to get educated, get a quality education, and move up. <clears throat> and they went in in Germany and, they, and these other places and they started looking. What made the difference? They made their teacher training schools much more rigorously and selective. They put developing high quality principals and teachers above efforts like reducing class size or equipment sports teams. And once they had these well-trained professionals in place, they found ways to hold the teachers accountable for the results while allowing creativity in their methods. Notably, in every case, these school systems devoted equal or more resources to the schools with the poor kids. That was the whole purpose of No Child Left Behind. No Child Left Behind was be before it. What we could do is, if I was in a poor district, I could just lower the standards on my tests and give people Bs. And so or I can have a school with 50 or 60 percent of the um, kids getting the honor roll. Or I, would like, or I would like to say the bumper sticker mentality where we go to the parents and say, my kid's on the honor roll so the parents don't question until if the kids do make it to college and mom and dad finds out that they have to pay a whole year of tuition just for their kids to take a year remedial um, courses, math and English. And so and the other part is Canada, Finland, and even Germany now know is you need high quality, you're gonna to have to pick the best, make the demands the best, educate the best, so you can put those individuals in the classroom. You give, you train the best people to be principal, you give them a level of flexibility, you hold them accountable, and you now go and put more money into some of the poorer schools. Because with no child left behind, if it goes in and says, you know what, school A isn't doing good, then the school district has to give more money to school A. If they don't want to give more money to school A, they better find a way to bring up the level of um, the educational standards of those kids. And as he said over and over again, without data, you're just another person with opinion. Without data, you're just another person with opinion. <clears throat> Here it is, Oregon, Japan, Germany now include PISA questions on their own standardized testing. Steve Payne, who until this year was West Virginia's superintendent of schools, redesigned his state curriculum to make it more demanding based in part on PETA findings. We had set the bar too low. A longitude study of 30,000 Canadian students recently found PETA scores to be more accurate than report card grades in predicting which kids would go to college. The largest result came, came, the latest results came out in 2010, and for the first time the test included Shanghai, which trounced every single country. Sch Schlesinger created credit Shanghai's success in part to the policy of rotating the best teachers into the region's worst performing schools, the opposite of what trends that, that tends to happen into the United States. China gets it. India gets it. <clears throat> if you take your best teachers and you put them to the best schools, hey, if I'm the best teacher, or even if I'm an average teacher, and I go to Harvard to teach Harvard students, you know what, my students are gonna come out pretty good, okay? 
in Shanghai goes, wait a minute, the kids who are going to Harvard, the kids who are going to the best schools, you know what? They're coming from a family background that's going to help them. They're going to have resources that are going to help them. They're going to have peers that are going to help them. They're going to have parents that are going to help them. And so they're going to be taken care of. Yes, we can make it demanding for them and we can take care of it. But the poor kids who may come from one parent or come from a working family house, they need all the help they can get. And, and again, when you give them help, you don't give them a handout. When you give them help, they tend to produce and they tend to raise. Shanghai, China understands the importance of intellectual capital. And so what they're doing right now, they're working to improve the intellectual capital of their students. You don't put the best teachers with the best students all the time. You have to rotate. You have to give everybody the opportunity for a fair chance and a fair opportunity. And you know what? <clears throat> you can put average teachers with top-notch kids, and education goes both ways. Plain and simple, if I'm an average teacher and I'm working with above-average kids, I'm going to work harder because I don't want to embarrass myself. If I'm a top-notch teacher and I'm working with deficient children, I take it upon myself to ensure that all my children reach the goals that I set. So it works both ways. And so, plain and simple, you, if you do it the other way around, you have teachers who have low expectations for the kids, and the kids reach those low expectations, and then you have top-notch teachers who are not really demanded because the kids are taking care of themselves. Now to go to the other part, again in um, Atlantic Magazine, there was um, a good article, it was about six months ago, and it talks about basically how in the United States we have decided that it's really best to reward all our kids for just trying. We're going to reward you for effort, not, um, <clears throat> not success. Because if we reward you for success, too many children are going to have negative impacts on their um, self-esteem. And so this article, again, Atlantic Monthly, and it's by Laura. G-O-T-T-L-I-E-B. And um, <clears throat> it says, nowadays it's not enough to be happy. If you can be even happier, the American dream and the pursuit of happiness has morphed from a quest for general contentment to the idea that you must be happy at all times in every way. I'm happy. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Paul Bowen, a psychiatrist from UCLA, goes, believes that many parents would do anything to avoid having their children experience even minor, mild discomfort, anxiety, or disappointment. Anything less than pleasure, as he puts it, with the result that when as adults they experience the normal frustrations of life, they think something must be terribly wrong. Again, <clears throat> what we're doing is bingo, bingo. We don't want our children to feel any sense of loss, any sense of failure. Don Kinglin, a child psychologist and a lecturer at Harvard. It's like the way our body immune system develops, he explains. You have to be exposed to the pathogens or your body won't know how to respond to attack. Kids also need to be exposed to discomforts, failures, and struggles. I know parents who call up the school to complain if their kid doesn't get to be on the school play or make the cuts for the ba baseball team. I know of one kid who said, that he didn't like another kid in the carpool. So instead of having their child learn to tolerate the other child, they offered to drive him to school themselves. By the time they're teenagers, they have no experience with hardship. Civilization is about adapting to less than perfect situations. Let, let parents, yet parents often have this insistrial, ins instantaneous reaction to unpleasantly, which I, is, I can fix this. All you have to do right now is to go to a lot of our schools, the high schools, the middle school, the, um, the elementary schools, and we'll see how many parents are bringing their, their kids to school. Gas is going up to almost $4 a gallon. Parents are spending a lot of time driving. <clears throat> We're paying taxes to have school buses, but we don't want to put our school kids on a school bus. We want to make sure our children don't feel sad or don't feel un uncomfortable. And um, 
So, but that's what happens. When do you learn from your failure? You know what? A three-year-old kid tries to get up, falls down, gets up, falls down. They learn from their failure. But we don't want our children to learn from <clears throat> a failure. <clears throat> Again, it's um, Gene Twing, co-author of Narcissistic Academic. When ego boosts in parents exclaim, good job, not just the first time a young children, child puts in shoes, but every single morning he does this, the child learns to feel that everything he does is special. Likewise, if the kid participates in activities where he gets stickers for good tries, he never gets negative feedback on his performance. All failures are reframed as good tries. According to Twin, indicators of self-esteem have risen cons consistently since the 1980s among middle school, high school, and child college students. But she says what starts off as healthy self-esteem can quickly morph into an inflated view, view of oneself, a self-absorption and a self sense of entitlement that looks a lot like narcissism. In fact, the rates of narcissism among college students have increased right along with self-esteem. Again, their parents act like their servants sh shuttle them to every activity they choose and catering to their every desire. Parents are now constantly telling their children how special and talented they are. They give them an inflated view of their specialness compared to other human beings. Instead of feeling good about themselves, they feel better than everyone else. In early adulthood, this becomes a big problem. People who feel like they are unusually special end up annihilating people around them. They don't know how to work on teams as well as deal with limits. They get into the workplace and expect to be stimulated all the time because their words were so saturated, saturated with activities. <clears throat> and again, here it is, part is, that was one of the things when we have in with the, um, the school board. And the parents came in. The parents are there out of meaningful attempts to do what's best for their children. And... <clears throat> And, and here's the part, as, as a school board member, we have to look at what is best for all the children. And <clears throat> some parents have the ability, they have the financial wherewithal that they can come to the school board meetings, they can come to the Saturday meetings, they can take part of the, the PTAs and the PTOs, to, <clears throat> excuse me, to push forward and help out their children. But not all parents can. And just because the parent can't doesn't mean that um, they don't care. <clears throat> and when you go in and you look, <clears throat> he told me about a game about against a very talented team. We lost 10 to 5, and the other team dominated. Our kids were very upset, they said. They got killed. And I said, what are you talking about? You guys beat the spread. The team we beat last year, last week, lost 14 to 1. These kids thought about it for a second, and they were, were then were like, you're right, we were great, we ruled. They felt so much better because I turned it around for them into something positive. When you get killed and there's no positive spin, the kids think they're a failure, it damages their self-esteem. At the end of the season, the, the league found a way to honor each child with a trophy. The Spirit Award went to the troublemaker who always talked and didn't pay attention, so we spun it into his being very spirited. The most improved player went to the kid who had not an ounce of athleticism in his body, but tries very hard. The coach award went to the kids who were just picking daisies, and the only ones, and the only way, and the only thing we could think of to say about them was that they showed up on time. There was also a most valuable player award, but the kid who deserved it three seasons in a row got it only after the first season because we wanted other kids to get a chance to get it. This is more cooperative approach versus the way I grew up in the competitive athlete. <clears throat> and so that's the way w we do it nowadays. And so the question is, what are we going to do for our kids? What are we going to do? And it goes right to, like I said, the question that gentleman asked at the school board meeting. Why aren't we talking about creating a demanding, highly competitive, not New Hampshire competitive-wise, not Cheshire County, not New Hampshire, not United States competitive-wise, but internationally competitive-wise math and science program.
Yes, Keen is doing really good with Chinese, with the Mandarin, because that's part of the, the future. But Keen, if we really want to do what's best for our students, what we need to do is create some competitive math, demanding math and science program. If it means we have to take away from sports and we have to take away from some of the other programs, that's what we got to do. And then we have to be honest to our kids and say, a 90 is a 90. If you only got a 70, we're not going to go and give you a 90 for good effort. We're not going to put you on the honor roll for good effort. What we're going to do is we're going to give you an honest evaluation where you are in this point of time and how we're going to help you, if you're willing to work, to move you up that ladder. Otherwise, we're not being competitive. We're just setting up our kids for failure. So just something to, for them to think about. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to <clears throat> have about a, a six-minute little clip here for people to, to watch. And um, it's, a lot of it has to do with art. And you can't have a quality education without art. And I just think art's important. And some of these things will be um, a local. Maybe you'll be able to pick them out. And other ones are part of the United States. And other part are up in Canada. So I'll be back in about six minutes.
Well, welcome back. Um, hopefully you've spotted at least two or three, the ones in the Keene area. Um, Ernie was able to pick them up right off the bat, and um, hopefully you'll be able to. And so <clears throat> now we're going to do inside the number game and how do we um, play with numbers. <coughs> Excuse me again. The president just came out with his new budget, and his new budget predicts... Um, a deficit of $1.3 trillion, which is um, kind of strange because just about a week and a half ago, the president just went back to Congress <clears throat> and asked to increase the um, debt ceiling by $1.2 trillion. So if his budget is $1.3 trillion, that means sometimes after the election, um, whoever, if the president gets reelected or there's a new president, someone is going to have to go back to Congress and look for um, at least another trillion dollars in um, bringing up the debt. But we're going to explain how um, the government does it. Okay, put this in the wrong one. So right now we have, um, say for example, expenditures of um, four trillion dollars with revenue of 2.7 and which brings you the deficit of 1.3 so what congress does is it's two things in the um what the president will pick on he'll, he'll go and he'll say the inflation rate and the um for example if he says the inflation rate is going to be 1.5 percent for example Last year, they said the inflation rate was supposed to be like 0.08, and um, so that's what they project for an increase for Social Security and retirees and disability, but it ended up being 3.6, which then expands the, um, the, de the deficit, which adds on to debt. Then they say gross domestic product is going to be, how would I put it in here, 3.5%. So part of the game is when you go in it, you will always want to underestimate inflation <clears throat> because inflation will then have a, a different result on your money going, your cost going forward. And you always want to over, um, over inflate your um, GDP projections because basically your GDP projections would say, okay, 3%, so 3% growth. You know, again, making it really simple is um, plain and simple. It'd say, okay, our revenues are going to come up 3.5%. Um, so basically what happens is, um, and then Congress works for 10 years out. So if it goes over the next 10 years, again, making it real simple, that inflation is going to be 1.5% and g growth domestic product is going to go up 3.5% a year. So over the next 10 year period, basically con the United States will spend $42.8 trillion and the revenues will be $31.67 trillion. And basically 10 years from now, our debt will be $11 trillion more than today or basically 26 to 27 trillion. But one of the things that you'll see as it goes forward By not cutting anything, basically, I can go and say, you know what? I have a plan to reduce the, um, the yearly deficit. And so I can go and say, 10 years from now, the yearly deficit will be a half a trillion dollars per year than it is right now. Okay. By these numbers, <clears throat> I would not be lying. And at the same time, 
I can go and promise the people that are, are supporting me. <clears throat> it's like, hey, inflation has gone up 1.5. So what I have done is, for example, over this 10 years, I've built in $2.81 trillion of additional spending over this same period because, quote, I've got this inflation factor in. And at the same time, basically, I can go and tell you that I've increased the revenue because I've increased the revenue point six, seven trillion dollars over the ten that ten year period. And again, basically, we're saying is okay, the projective <clears throat> reduction in the debt or is one point nine trillion dollars. So when they came in and Congress said, OK, or the president goes and says, over the next um, 10 years, uh, I have to reduce one point two trillion dollars in um, debt. Well, if I use this factor, yes, OK, plain and simple, one point eight seven trillion. I can now go and tell you, the American people. I'm, not, I'm on projection not only to get rid of that 1.2 trillion, then I'm also going to take 0.67 trillion dollars more in debt. So I'm doing what you asked for me and I'm making the hard choices when in fact I made no choice whatsoever. But that's how you get to play the game. <clears throat> game is game. <clears throat> now what happens if... Um, Inflation is 3.5% and <clears throat> the gross domestic product only goes up 2%. Inflation this year was 3.6 and the Fed saying possibly next year, maybe 1.7. The recent article in the um, King Sentinel said that 2012, 2013 could be flat. We could be flat to 2014. Now when these numbers change, basically, Believe it or not, the federal government gets to spend $3.58 trillion more based on what it's planning. And it's actually going to, and it's going to take in less revenue, basically a half, that's 42, $420 billion less in revenue. And so our debt actually goes up another $1.2 trillion. So that's why if you go down on the, web, the government's website or you go and get the, um, the budget, look at what the um, inflation projection is and look at what the GDP projection is. And then when you go and compare these numbers, you may find out <clears throat> it's quite a different story. Because, hey, yes, I'm cutting down. Like I said, I cut my plan, my plan, Doing this reduces the debt by $1.87 trillion, which is a true statement. Again, so plain and simple, that's how the numbers play. If we as an American family may go and say, you know what? Nope, nope, I can't do it. So like some of us, my, I'm, for the next five years, I'm only going to spend $4. Plain and simple. And four dollars, by spending four dollars, plain and simple, I now reduced 121, 111. And so basically each year going forward, now it's down to 90, down to 101. <clears throat> I'm making substantial reductions in my spending and reducing my debt load. That's the way we, the, the average person, does it. But this is government accounting. And so quite a difference between um, government accounting and our accounting. So again, that's how we do it in the, um, in the United States. That's how government does it. You don't want government to take care of your books because it's only a matter of time before you will be going bankrupt. You'll go to that checking account and you'll find out that you don't have anything. So again, another short number game and so thank you for the show and thank you for listening and i will see you out there on the long road thank you